This is a download from the BBC. For more information and our terms of use, go to bbc.co.uk slash radio3. What other writers influenced Edgar Rice Burroughs, who wrote Tarzan and Lenin? Infusmalist thought the b- arts were bad for us and yet is known as a revolutionary thinker on education. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, born 300 years tomorrow. I hate books. They only teach us to talk about things we know nothing about. That was the actor Samuel West with a line or two characteristically unsettling lines from Rousseau's Emile. His readings will punctuate the programme. In a moment we'll talk with a novelist about Rousseau's great and defining autobiography, The Confessions, reflect with the philosopher and policy expert on what Rousseau meant by freedom and how he has influenced our thinking. And on the eve of the European summit we'll discuss what Rousseau has to say about Europe's present discontents. To discuss this most protean of writers, I'm joined by Jeff Mulgan, Chief Executive of Nestor and former Head of Strategy in Tony Blair's Downing Street, by Susan James, the philosopher, Richard Watmore, who's written widely on European revolutionary thought, and by Lucy Powell, an 18th century literary historian. But let's start with Rousseau himself, with the wonderfully immodest beginnings of the Confessions. I have resolved on an enterprise which has no precedent and which, once complete, will have no imitator. My purpose is to display to my kind a portrait in every way true to nature, and the man I shall portray will be myself. Simply myself. I know my own heart and understand my fellow man, but I am made unlike any one I have ever met. I will even venture to say that I am like no one in the whole world. I may be no better, but at least I am different. Whether nature did well or ill in breaking the mould in which she formed me is a question which can only be resolved after the reading of my book. Let the last tramp sound when it will, I shall come forward with this work in my hand to present myself before my sovereign judge and proclaim aloud... Here is what I have done. So let the numberless legion of my fellow man gather round me and hear my confessions. Let them groan at my depravities and blush for my misdeeds. But let each one of them reveal his heart at the foot of thy throne with equal sincerity. And may any man who dares say, I was a better man than he. Is there any better beginning for an autobiography than that? Uh, I'm joined by Lawrence Norfolk, as I mentioned, the the novelist. Lawrence, you're a writer. What does it mean to you as a writer, this book? Um, I mean, the, the Confessions is the is the one I would save of all his of all his works. I think it's the the book in which his 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 essential method, a method which in some ways underlies all his work, found its truest and most untrammeled expression. Um, he he adumbrated it at the half, characteristically halfway through this very long book, and he wrote, um, I have only one faithful guide on which I can count the succession of feelings which have marked the development of my being. Um, he, and that, that's, the, that's the course he follows, and his project... Um, in the Confessions was, I think, the one most congenial to him. That's where his his method was best suited. Um, he, we've had the, the the agenda described, and there's a, a, quite a lot to unpack there. Of course, when he says, you know, that there was no precedent for my book, that's not quite true. Augustine's Confessions loomed fairly large behind it, and what's also not quite true is that it was it, is that we will have no imitators. This is the first celebrity autobiography. <laughs> God help us. Um, and then then it gets more complex when he says, the man I shall portray will be myself. There's there's three different people in that clause. Um, they're all Jean Jacques Rousseau. Um, how he starts to unpack the business of using the word I um, sets an agenda which other writers um, will have to both follow and 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 sort of be awed by. Um, if I could just um, uh, add and break that very very briefly, um, there was a very interesting essay written by Jem Coetzee in the mid eighties where he says, "This is the South African novelist." Indeed, it is um, where he writes the terrain of truth, self knowledge, and sincerity, where Tolstoy spent so much of his writing life was mapped out by Rousseau. Um, in the place where 
Kutzia writes Tolstoy, there are a very large number of names could go in that space. Now, you said early on, you quoted Rousseau's idea of a succession of feelings. And of course, succession means there's no kind of continuity. One of the wonders of this book, isn't it, is that it kind of follows its contradictions. We, you know, Sam read out about shame and depravity. This is a book, it doesn't let everything hang out because it's artfully conceived, but it is a book where shame is as important as celebration. Shame is his guarantee of authenticity. He says, I will tell all. And then the, the way that he says to the reader that this is true is by relating episodes which um, make the book at once compulsively readable and sometimes toe-curlingly embarrassing. <laughs> there are hide-behind-the-sofa moments in abundance in the confessions. <laughs> yeah, and but not, you hide behind the sofa and read. You, you peer through your fingers. Um, thankfully, they have gaps. Can you give us an example? Um, sh- sh- I, I, I'm not going to go with the, with the <laughs> usual sexual stuff, the onanism, the exhibitionism, or even the masochism. Um, the, I think the, the really shocking examples are the ones where he slips morally um there's a there's a terrible incident and it's it's so trivial but he um he was about 18 and he he's he's in a he's in a household and he steals a, a length of ribbon from the household where a lady has just died and is caught um it's, it's a trivial offense the worst that can happen to him is he gets dismissed but instead he he blames the young serving girl marion who is um sweet and fair and likes him as well and um, and she behaves with great decorum. He 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 describes all this, and it's it's appalling. She, I mean, he says you know, she says, "I don't know why you're doing this to me, Jean Jack." They're they're in front of the household who are ac- accusing him, and you just want to shout at him, you know, just just confess, confess, Jean Jack, just confess. No, but which he, of course he does, he, which he in is, the book. which he yeah. is. But I mean, the key to confession, isn't he? The most staggering part of that opening paragraph is he t- decides that he will determine when the day of judgment is. <laughs> Actually, what he says is, it doesn't matter when the day of judgment, because this book is my day of judgment. The, the, the confession normally takes its place within an eschatological narrative. You have the, the offence, you have the confession, you have repentance, and you have absolution. His, his genius was to, was to uncouple confession from that religious context and place it within the context of sensibility. And and this book is the record of what happens when you do that. The first time it was done. This book is the book of a rebel, isn't it? It's an early version of romanticism. And then, of course, it becomes the model. Everybody becomes a rebel, don't they, after Rousseau? I remember a great critic saying of Rousseau that nobody looked at mountains before Rousseau. Well, certainly nobody looked at themselves in the way he did until he came along. Uh, he, I think, um, f- for me, he was the first and the greatest be- because after him it was impossible to pursue this project wholly without irony. Um, I-, I think he was uniquely fitted by temperament but also by hos- historical position to do what he did. After this, it's much more difficult, hence Kosia's, um tortured essay and also Tolstoy's later dictum about Rousseau. He says, Rousseau lied and he believed his lies. Um, which sounds like something you should carve on a stone, and then you realise it's a typical Tolstoy and um, saying it's a, it's a stick waving in the water. As you look at it, it dissolves under your gaze. What it, does he mean? He believed his lies. I mean, you know, no, but of course it's wonderful because actually Rousseau said he preferred to be a man of paradoxes than prejudices. And he's lovely, isn't he, at saying one thing and then saying the other, and both are true and both are untrue at the same time. Even at his worst, we never hate him in this book. <laughs> oh, you never hate him. Maybe I do, but maybe you don't. Well, listen, we'll come back to the confessions and more general discussions uh, later. I wondered now if we could just hear something, um, uh, talk about Rousseau and freedom. Now, Rousseau may have died more than 20 years before the beginning of the French Revolution, but that hasn't stopped him from being condemned, at least by some, as one of the fathers of its authoritarian excesses. At the same time, he's been celebrated by others as a thinker whose reflections on freedom helped to lead to the overthrow of the absolute monarchy of Louis XVI. But that's the bigger picture. But let's go back to the early time of his life. Richard, he wasn't a member, was he, of the educated elite? He certainly wasn't. I think that his birth in Geneva and the Genevan context of his life, he keeps returning to Geneva uh, throughout his life. He has a very complicated relationship with Geneva. And you have to remember that Geneva perceives itself to be the Rome for Protestants. 
and it's the the center of the Calvist International. It has ambitions, despite being a very, very tiny but independent republic. It has ambitions to moralize the world. Life is austere there. Citizens are very proud. They're independent-minded. And Rousseau comes from a, a family which unites uh, magistracy, which is uh, the highest uh, level of the state, and bourgeois status. His father uh, is, is a citizen, but he's a watchmaker, and Rousseau is born into a milieu where he ought to become a magistrate, potentially. He's a, he, he is a citizen of Geneva. He's proud of that fact throughout his life. His early education uh, collapses, really, although his father uh, reads the classics, uh, especially Plutarch. But, but he's very different, isn't he, from Diderot and Voltaire. Voltaire becomes a master of philosophy. This is a guy, to put it in the old-fashioned way, who never goes to university. He wanders Europe instead. He certainly does, after he finds himself locked outside the city gates at the age of 16, he decides not to return to the, the engra engraver's apprenticeship where, which he's been serving, and he, he leaves. He converts to Catholicism. That, in a sense, is his first act of rebellion, and it complicates his claim to be a citizen of Geneva because he cannot, he cannot make that claim until he returns to the Calvinist church. OK, well, then the Calvinist church, of course... Protestants are wonderful about confessions, to go back to what Lawrence and I were talking about. Lucy, you're sat here. He's one of those extraordinary figures, isn't he, whose life is written into his writings, not only in the autobiography, but everywhere. Yeah, I mean, you can really see in Rousseau these quintessential tensions that would come, in a sense, to define modernity. So he is the son of a watchmaker who becomes one of the most celebrated men, not just in France, but in all of Europe. And yet he despises celebrity. So, and, and he's also incredibly um, controversial, actually, about some of the dearest held tenets of the Enlightenment itself. So in the Discourse on Inequality, which is an essay that he writes in 1755, is one of my favourites. He, he argues that civilization is not necessarily progressive. In other words, that the, the, all of these arguments that Voltaire and Diderot and others were having, um, he was questioning. In some senses, what he did was to turn the spirit of the Enlightenment in on itself. In other words, he shone that questioning light, not just on the world that he saw, but on the philosophers as well. That, to me, is the mark of his genius, that he's prepared to include everything in his analysis, even if it entails a sort of vortex like, you know, tumble from grace, yeah. which is then, of course, what happens to Rousseau. I mean, Richard, he's a kind of idiosyncratic human being, isn't he, that's there in the books, but it's also there in the life. This is a man who becomes, who is born a Protestant, you've mentioned Calvinism, becomes a Catholic, becomes a Protestant again, to go to Geneva. I mean, he'll do whatever is necessary, won't he? But he's independently minded and he angers everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and in all of his writings, he is iconoclastic. He is... A, he asserts his independence. He refuses to bow. He refuses to take a pension. He refuses to acknowledge that uh, kings are his masters or aristocrats. And yet he lives in a world of court politics, of privilege. And that's why he becomes an icon for rebels. Although, as we'll come to a bit later on, he's not a rebel himself in his politics. And what about in his life? I mean, Lucy, there's this extraordinary passage in the Confessions. This is a man who we all celebrate as someone taking very great care of children who says, I dispensed mm. with my five illegitimate children and got rid of them. Yes, I mean, yeah, he, it was Voltaire who, in fact, displayed that piece of knowledge to the world in a pamphlet in the middle of the, the 1750s. But uh, Rousseau 
doesn't see that actually as a paradox. He sees that as being quintessentially Rousseauian because he was so concerned that these children shouldn't be tainted with um, the brushes that people were, you know, tarring him with. He said it was better for them. You know, I did it for them. Poor me, actually, he says in his final work, The Reveries of the Solitary Walker, because I love children and it's terrible for me that I wasn't able to spend my life with them. But those tensions you'll find everywhere. So it's beautiful that he writes a novel, an epistolary novel, Julie, it becomes one of the most famous and successful novels of the entire 18th century. Um, they couldn't print it fast enough. Um, I think there were 70 editions of that novel were printed before 1800, which is astonishing. And people were renting it out by the hour. That's how popular it was. The first page, he says, I'm paraphrasing, oh, how tragic it is that I live in an age when I have to write a novel. In other words, that you couldn't understand my philosophy just as it is. I have to render it into art and then you will appreciate me. Richard, in, in that sense, this, this large and life figure, I can, what I can never work out with Rousseau, is he French or is he European? To make a, a distinction which some may feel is not necessary. But, you know, this is a man who goes, comes to England, meets Hume, lives in Turin for a time, is thought of as French but is Swiss... He's certainly not French. He, <laughs> he loves the Italian language, for example, thinks it's a much more natural language than, than the French language. He's not Swiss either, uh, although lots of people call him Swiss, because Geneva is an independent republic. Mm -hmm. I think you can actually only understand Rousseau if you go back to Geneva and you recognise that it's an independent city-state with aspirations because of its... Calvinist heritage, as has been said, but also it's suffering an identity crisis because the future of Geneva, the future of these little city-states is so uncertain and you can see... OK, you're telling me what he isn't. What is he? He is somebody who tries to solve the greatest problems of the age and the greatest problems of the age are how do you survive and how do you maintain your moral legitimacy in a world tainted by commerce, by luxury, by public credit, in a world that you expect to collapse, where you might be replicating the history of Rome, you anticipate the decline and fall of contemporary civilization, and the question is, what do you save, what do you maintain, and how can you do that? Lucy? But the thing that's wonderful is that he doesn't ever give you an answer. He gives <laughs> you a series of problematizations. The Social Contract, probably his now most famous work, uh, is not an answer to any of those problems. He's, his, his optimism is all in himself, in a sense. It's in his rhetoric. It's in his ability to wrestle with the problem, not actually to find a solution for it. You will never find the, the, the ground in Rousseau. You'll never get to the bottom where you say, ah, that's the formula, thank you very much. I think that's wrong because he does give an answer. He loves the alpine cantons. <laughs> he loves mountains. He loves the life that's austere. He loves a life that's rural. He loves a life of frugality. He, he describes many times across all of his writings the small communities, wooden houses, um, where men can be men, where women can be women, where children so grow Geneva up. So Geneva and the Alpine villages become a kind of utopian image for him. Well, even Geneva is problematic because it's commercial. Ironically, the watchmaking trade that makes Geneva rich... The profits of the watchmaking trade are invested in the debts of Europe. Geneva has lots of funds invested in the French debt, especially. And for Rousseau... Sounds remarkably like mm -hmm. now to me. Well, it is. <laughs> and that means that Geneva itself is tainted. And one of the issues that Rousseau wants to address and wants to proclaim to the world is that we're on the edge of a precipice. But he does think there's a solution. The solution is to live in tiny communities where... Uh, we're not going to embrace luxury. We're going to live according to necessity and we're going to remain close and true to nature. OK, well, listen, we're going to come back to that in the, in the bigger discussion. I know there's a breath of despair around the <laughs> table from somebody who wanted to come in. But now, you know, we've talked so far about the confessions with the writer. We've talked about kind of his life and times. I want us now to fix on this issue of freedom, you know, Freedom, both personal and political, preoccupied Rousseau in a way almost nothing else did. But before I talk to Jeff Mulgan and to Susan James about Rousseau and freedom, 
let's hear first the writer's ringing declaration at the beginning of the social contract. Man is born free, and everywhere he is in chains. One thinks himself the master of others, and still remains a greater slave than they. How did this change come about? I do not know. What can make it legitimate? That question I think I can answer. Wonderful. I just want to listen to it and let it settle in. Um, at one level, people have interpreted passages like that in two ways. He's the forerunner of kind of civic, civic liberalism and he's the forerunner of revolutionary authoritarianism. I mean, Jeff, do you think he's both? Neither? Well, certainly for 200 years, the English-speaking world has often seen him as the uh, source of evil. Uh, Burke... Uh, denounced him as the really the cause of the terror and also a man lacking taste all this uh, love of frugality meant he wasn't as a true urban man uh, Karl Popper thought he was to blame for both Nazism and Stalinism which is quite an achievement <laughs> uh, I think in some ways it's easier to see him now perhaps more clearly than it was in the middle of the 20th century as a man who was obsessed with freedom who had, in some ways, a very original sense that civilization was crushing freedom, was creating people much too concerned about what others thought about them, creating layers of, uh, of artifice and culture, which again inhibited people and took them away from their authentic selves. But I think, as Lucy said, he never really, I think, answers many of the dilemmas of freedom. He had a, a passion for breaking free from monarchs and aristocrats and traditions and the church as well. He certainly didn't believe that man was born fallen. And I think it's really important to remember that that was the context in which he said man was born free. That's very different from being born a sinner. But he didn't resolve the contradictions of, a, of an urban civilization and how it handles freedom. Susan? Well, I think um, I want to defend Rousseau as having a coherent view of freedom. I'm All glad on one. one side of the table we have the <laughs> incoherent romantics and the other the lucid 18th century rationalists. Go on, Susan. Um, I agree with Jeff that, of course, his theory has problems. And I think that part of Rousseau's great interest is, and his great contribution is in exploring those problems and sort of really making us address them. But I think that his view of freedom is actually a kind of familiar one familiar from the Roman tradition and from Machiavelli, and that Rousseau is a defender of a republican conception of freedom, according to which, in order to be free, you have to live without being subject to the arbitrary will of anyone else. An arbitrary will is um, someone who has the power to interfere with you without taking account of your interests. OK, so and how does he square that? Because then there are issues, and I suppose this is a question addressed to both of you, if the individual will is paramount, he still also believes in communities, doesn't he? And he's wrestling all the time with trying to resolve those two issues, Jeff. Well, sometimes he writes, as we just heard, about freedom being, meaning obedience to the law you have prescribed for yourself. Yes. And it's quite hard to imagine a society where everyone only follows the laws they have prescribed for themselves. But he also talks about the general will, and the general will was the concept which then was used to batter him by Burke, Karl mm. Popper, and so on. The odd thing is that when you actually... Well, tell us what you think <clears throat> they thought the general will was. They thought the general will was a, a sort of abstracted synthesis of the collective interest, which then crushed the individual. So to put it this freedom. way, Lenin would have thought the party, the Bolshevik party, represented the general will and spoke for the actual uh, people. Absolutely, a collective interest which was above and beyond individual interest. Yet, oddly, when, when Rousseau writes about it sometimes, he writes about precisely the general will as the aggregation of individual interests and then taking away the pluses and minuses, which is almost the way in which economics talks about public welfare, uh, not as a sort of Stalinist uh, abstraction sitting above people, but rather almost like a utilitarian account of lots of individual wills. So community, civic responsibility, civic life. How do you think, going on from Jeff, Rousseau negotiates that with that sense of personal responsibility? 
Well, I think that Rousseau thinks that the project of living in political society is the project of collectively learning to work out what is for our common good, what we can all agree about and what we can all decide on as the fundamental principles or laws, as Rousseau says, by which we will all live because they benefit all of us. And Rousseau wants to say equally. Now, as Jeff says, it's hard to imagine how we do that. And Rousseau's account of how we do that is, I think, that it's a sort of very, very complex and delicate, delicate cultural process which can only, can only really make any progress in certain conditions. But what we're trying to learn to do as individuals is to distinguish our private wills from our sense of what is for our collective good. But the, his problem isn't, as far as I remember, is that Rousseau is anxious that there isn't enough sense of common good. So he wants music, he wants symbolism, he wants okay. ceremony, which remarkably reminds me of David Cameron recently wanting Christianity to be the kind of shared grammar or the diamond jubilee, which is one of those symbols. Am I right, Jeff, that he both wanted it and he longed for it, but he didn't quite know if it could be realised? He wanted people to morally cultivate themselves. He talked of a civic religion in place of traditional religions. But where he was so different from his English contemporaries was in his suspicion of democracy in the sense that we would mean it. Uh, and he wrote repeatedly that any people who elect representatives at that very moment cease to be free because the representatives stand above them. The government governs, not the people. But he never quite answered how a people can govern itself without representatives. You can perhaps in a Swiss canton where you all gather uh, and make decisions. But in even a city like Geneva, let alone France, how on earth do you do, you do this? How on earth, Susan? <laughs> it is a big problem. But I think it's important to realise that for Rousseau... The Assembly only has to gather to make quite limited decisions. It only has to legislate these very general principles. And it can then, in Rousseau's view, um, elect or choose magistrates or officials who run the government for it. And so you can have, as it were, a people who is sovereign, and you can have them as it were, having their laws enacted for them and implemented for them by governments of various kinds. So there's a strange way in which Rousseau is a Democrat and yet isn't really a Democrat <laughs> because he's not saying we all have to do all of this. And actually, I think he favours a sort of elective aristocracy, ultimately. Yeah, he he yeah. remains wonderfully a not only but also writer. Before, I want to try and bring people in, but I also want to get Sam now, because we've been talking about freedom. The obverse of freedom is slavery, and there's an extraordinary passage of Rousseau's rhetoric at its very best. An unbroken horse erects his mane, paws the ground and starts back impetuously at the sight of the bridle while one which is properly trained suffers patiently even whip and spur. So savage man will not bend his neck to the yoke to which civilised man submits without a murmur, but prefers the most turbulent state of liberty to the most peaceful slavery. We cannot, therefore, from the civility of nations already enslaved, judge of the natural disposition of mankind for or against slavery. We should go by the prodigious efforts of every free people to save itself from oppression. I know that the former are forever holding forth in praise of the tranquillity they enjoy in their chains, and that they call a state of wretched servitude a state of peace. But when I observe the latter, sacrificing pleasure, peace, wealth, power, and life itself to the preservation of that one treasure which is so disdained by those who have lost it, when I see free-born animals dash their brains out against the bars of their cage from an innate impatience of captivity, when I behold numbers of naked savages that despise European pleasures, braving hunger, fire, the sword and death to preserve nothing but their independence, I feel that it is not for slaves to argue about liberty. To say, I wish I'd have written that passage. Uh, Richard, how do you respond to that? I want to kind of bring in as many people as I can now into this conversation. Yes, I think Sue's distinction between sovereignty and government, which Rousseau adhered to, is fundamental importance. 
we are supposed to make our own laws. It's for magistrates to apply the laws to particular cases. We make the general rules and we're not going to constrain ourselves and therein lies our liberty. But we can only respect one another and one another's liberty if we know one another. And that means that small communities are of fundamental importance. Rousseau does not believe in large states. He does not believe in large political entities. Okay, we will come back to this since we're talking about European integration at the end. Do you want to respond to that, Jeff? Yeah, I agree with that, absolutely. And I, I think it's worth remembering Rousseau was part of a, a tradition of French thinking about voluntary servitude. I mean, he, he didn't in some ways invent this uh, as a way of looking at the, the self-enslavement of people. Uh, Boetti was doing that at least a, maybe a century, two centuries before uh, Rousseau, and making that almost the fundamental political paradox. Why do people accept servitude? Just as he asked, why do people accept inequality, that some people grab property, put a fence around a field and claim it for themselves? Why do the other people take that for granted? Because if they don't take it for granted, you can't keep your property. And I think those are very live ideas. They're they're in no way anachronistic today. Susan and then Lucy. Well, just going on from that, because I agree, I think those are very live ideas, and that one of Rousseau's great contributions is his analysis of what he calls amour propre, this kind of craving that people who live in political society, who are, in his view, sort of already, in a way, corrupted, have for recognition from other people. And this kind of desire to be recognised and valued for what you are, for your good qualities, is something that he thinks, of course, can be tremendous virtuous, but is very easily corrupted. Lucy? Well, the only thing I just wanted to add to that, which I think is completely true and really interesting, is that it seems to me that he's not actually arguing for a return to some kind of paradisical past, which he knows is impossible. He understands really completely that he is a child of the Enlightenment, that he is only able to make these incredibly witty and learned attacks on wit and learning because of the position from which he speaks. That, that's not to say that he's ironising himself, but he is holding those tensions in his writings, and I think that he's fully aware of the fact that he does that, and that is, to me, what makes him so alive and so modern. We've mentioned inequality. Um, How central do we think inequality or equality was to his definition of freedom? Because after all, those are the two great spurs, aren't they, on which a lot of political philosophy has kind of um, come to grief, Susan? Well, I think that Rousseau thinks that equality is important as a condition of means to freedom. And it's that way round, as it were, that freedom for him is the ultimate value, not being a slave as we were just touching on before. Do you think that's true, Richard? Let well, me read you something. No citizen should be so opulent as to be able to buy another, and none so poor as to be constrained to sell himself. I don't read as well as Sam, but you'll get the sense. <laughs> he certainly loves equality. He loves moderate wealth. He thinks that what is wrong with the world is that we're all corrupted by the rich, by being involved in the lives and the mores of the rich. As a servant, he experienced this at at first hand, of course, uh, in his early life. So, and he becomes an icon, a revolutionary icon, I think, because he hates aristocracy. The reason the French revolutionaries embrace him is because you can find within Rousseau's works the condemnation and the ridicule and brutal attacks upon the notion of aristocracy. Having said that, he doesn't provide a clear transition mechanism of how you go from a state of servitude to a state of liberty. Yeah, One has to say nobody's ever quite done that, so (laughs) let's not complain that he hasn't done it. Um, Listen, let's leave the discussion on freedom and and broaden it. Uh, But before we do, let me just remind listeners that this is BBC Radio 3 and I'm Philip Dodd and you're listening to Nightwaves. And just to remind you all that you can listen to all our programmes. They're available to listen to or download as a podcast from the Radio 3 website. Rousseau and Europe now. We've touched on it at the beginning. And tomorrow, of course, a European summit takes place where issues around national independence and the virtues and vices of democratic nations will be both explicitly and implicitly on the agenda. So what I want us to do, let us imagine the ghost of Rousseau sitting there between Angela Merkel and Francois Hollande. 
What would this thinker born into the canton of Geneva, whose writings on democracy, as Richard has said, were often couched in terms of small nations and city-states, what would he make of um, of European integration? Jeff, Jacques Attali recently said there'll be a hundred new nations in the world this century. How he knows that is beyond me. But there are some, Catalonia, the Kurdish, and so on and so on. Do you think that the crisis in Europe is partly a crisis of a kind of supranation state? And actually we're going to go back to small nations, which has got some echo of, of course, of where we came in with Rousseau. Well, I don't know what on earth Rousseau would say to Angela Merkel right at the moment. I think he'd be pretty sceptical of a project which used money as its primary integrating uh, idea, money in pursuit of greater wealth for Europe. But he was sceptical of the role of, of representatives, of intermediate bodies of any kind, and Europe is thick with intermediate bodies and representatives who are not seen to represent. Uh, and that is in some ways the fundamental sort of question of Europe at the moment and of what Angela Merkel is trying to do, which is to integrate budget setting and create stronger representative structures as the answer to the problem. His instincts would be almost the opposite, would be to break Europe up into not just small nations, but small cantons and villages and towns, ideally to even leave the cities, perhaps, and, and go back to a, a, a more frugal rural uh, existence. Lawrence? I think what, what, really, what really chafed him was, was the vertical axis. Um, the, the one time he got um, really worked up about his position in the world was when he was mistaken by the um and about the French ambassador to Venice as his servant rather than a fellow diplomat and um it's worth pointing out of course that you know the king of prussia at the time had more in common with the king of france than with any of his subjects that's also true of the time in which we live in where we're um uh, the kleptocrats who run our finance systems have a great deal more in common with each other whether they hail from uh, Montelimar or Annecy or wherever um, than the people who don't live next door to them and clean their floors. So I think um, uh, Rousseau would have felt quite at home um, sitting next to Angela Merkel would have um, <laughs> would have recognised the situation for what it was and um, gone home to write another set of confessions in which he would have been just as angry as the first set. <laughs> Even more angry, I like to think. I, I mean, Richard, you've sung the song of the small cantons and you're, you're right, but Rousseau was equally thoughtful that nations are selfish beasts that's right and geneva is not a canton it's yeah. not a canton right. until 18, i knew you until, were going to say this to me yesterday. until 1815 it's an independent republic the big question for contemporaries and contemporaries hoped that rousseau was going to answer the problem of how do republican confederations like the dutch and the swiss or north america uh, as a federal republic, how do they survive? How do they maintain themselves? How do they prevent nationalism or rebellions from breaking out? There's a revolution at Geneva in 1782. Rousseau is involved with the rebel movement at Geneva. And what's interesting about their perspective on Rousseau is that they argue, in the end, that he loves peace more than liberty. And the reason for that is because, for example, in the social contract, he says, I've not finished this book. What I'm missing out is a section on international relations and war and commerce. And what everybody hopes is Rousseau is going to explain how you maintain Republican confederations into the modern world. He never finishes the social contract, the institution politique, which is part of. He never answers that question. And Republicans are profoundly depressed <laughs> with Rousseau as he gets older. Well, I would just dis That's dis Lucy. say yes. that, yeah, I, taking it back to your original question, that I think he would have been horrified to see a woman um, in, a in a position of political power because he was quite clear on the fact that that was a very bad idea in his novel, Emile. But interestingly, after that novel is published and after the social contract is published, um, a warrant is issued for Rousseau's arrest and he is, for the rest of his life, really, in exile. And you see him sort of hopping borders. He spends some time in Switzerland, he spends some time in Bernese territory, he spends some time in England, an ill-fated trip um, that David Hume, the philosopher, uh, organises for him, which uh, ends with him writing to a friend, Hume, this is, saying um, he's plainly mad, having long been mad-ish. 
And I think that there is some, some sense of a European unity might in those final years when he felt so psychologically traumatised by having been a celebrity. Let's not forget, 1761 was the publication of Julie. He was the most celebrated author in Europe to having been this sort of hunted exile from hopping from house to house and sort of feeling so persecuted. I think he, there is a sense in which... Um, eliminating those borders may have brought him a sense of ease and peace. Susan? Yes, I think that one of the problems that Rousseau has with large states is um, just a problem about what people can empathise with, what they can know about their neighbours. And in a small state, the idea is you can sort of try and work out or begin to work out what the general will dictates. But in a large mm. state, what on earth is going on? I think that's a really important problem for us today. And, you know, it does, of course, breed large tensions across big states. Richard, Jeff? You've also got to remember that Rousseau expects apocalypse. He doesn't think that the large commercial monarchies of Europe are going to last because they're going bankrupt. And you can read Rousseau's writings as a perspective on the world after the deluge, a post-apocalyptic world where you are remaking politics after national bankruptcies have occurred. So, <laughs> so that's, the, that's the apocalyptic Rousseau who lives in 2012. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, yeah. Well, that was the Rousseau of the... <laughs> no, of, no, I understand. The, yeah. But he also, as far as I remember, also imagined a Europe that would be invaded by China and Russia. Especially the Russians. He's worried about the Russians invading after the national bankruptcies have occurred, but then he thinks that nomadic peoples, the Tatars, will themselves overrun the Russian state and all of Europe and will be back to a dark age in which potentially, as with the fall of the Roman Empire, these little city republics will thrive <laughs> again. again. Yes. But, but this time they won't collapse as they did during the Renaissance and after and become like Venice and Florence. That's why you other. shouldn't look to philosophers for looking at the future because they often get it wrong, Jeff. Well, his life was a bit apocalyptic. He managed to upset mm. everyone. He upset every religion. He upset every major intellectual of the time, <laughs> denounced him. All the political sort of thinkers he thought would be on his side, he turned against him. But just on this question of, of nationalism, uh, one of the things which I think we maybe forget about him is he's often thought of describing the rational basis of legitimacy in the social contract, but he did also believe there had to be a sentimental aspect to what held together the nation, uh, and the passions had to be, uh, in, in a sense, realised as well as uh, reason. And in the, in the 20th century, he was much criticised as a forerunner of an assertive nationalism. He did, he did annoy everyone, and, and yet he's, he's held in such affectionate regard now. I mean, here we all are. Everyone around this table has quite a different view of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, but, but all of us sort of like him. Um, and for someone who is, so, I say, for I'm not who, sure "like" is the word I would so, use, wouldn't it? And someone, awed by for him. someone so con for someone so contradictory. Yeah. Um, I think um, everyone you can can get over that hump um, and go to the sort of the sincerity of of the enterprise. Mm -hmm. We're not quite sure what he believed in in the end, but he really did believe it. <laughs> well, no. Well, then let us just because we've got a couple of minutes left. Each of you briefly, because at one level, you're right, we've got a rational Rousseau, and there's this one who's obsessed with the succession of feelings. Is he above all a writer, Lucy, who happens to write in philosophical forms? Well, I think that, that philosophy at that particular moment wasn't as, it wasn't sort of Hegelian, Wittgensteinian, it wasn't sort of delineated as philosophical writing in the same way that it is perhaps today. Not, not Men, technical. <laughs> yeah, it was understandable. OK. Um, All right, Jeff, you? Well, he started as a composer of music, and maybe we should think of him as a composer of many different things. OK. Lawrence? Uh, for, for me, he's, the, he's always the confessee of, of, of choice. He was, uh, he's, a, he's wonderful in the confessions. But you don't mean he's the Oprah Winfrey, do you? No, I don't mean um, I, it's true because I feel it's true, which is the operification of the universe. No, he's, um, he, sees, he sees himself more clearly than that. He digs deeper. Richard? He was called at the time the critic of the critics. And in some ways that summarises him. But I always like to think of him as his contemporaries did. Also, especially those from Geneva, as a potential Calvin for the modern world. That's frightening. Susan? This is getting more and more difficult <laughs> as it goes around the table. Um, so I think that Rousseau is 
such an extraordinarily fertile person who writes in so many genres and so many on so many topics. Um, but there's perhaps a thread running through it, which is his tremendous anxiety about his own need for recognition. And I'm going to do something terrible now, Sam. You've been sat here. You told me you knew nothing about Rousseau. What is it now you've taken away from this conversation? There's a line in Clough. This is Arthur Hugh Clough, the 19th century poet. Fact shall be fact for me, and the truth, the truth is ever flexible, changeable, vague, and multiform and doubtful. That's what it reminds me of. Not bad, not bad. That's why we have actors in the room. Uh, we asked you to end, asked you to end the programme. Do you want to just give us one of those lines of Rousseau's that in a sense is almost Wildean in its kind of paradoxical nature? Ordinary readers, forgive my paradoxes. One must make them when one reflects. And whatever you may say, I prefer being a man with paradoxes than a man with prejudices. Here, here is, I think, what one says to that. Thanks very much to my guests this evening, to Susan James, Richard Watmar, Jeff Mulgan, Lucy Powell, Lawrence Norfolk, and to Samuel West. That's all from me this evening, and the producer was Allegra McElroy.